In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would go there. Tommy, if you could bring my vocals up just a bit. My throat is a little rough and rugged. I have a feeling I'm going to be drinking a lot of water. Um, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, we're going to talk about that in just a second. How, I have a question, though. How many of you actually went to see Jesus Revolution? Oh! <gasps> Was it? Okay, okay, hang on. Hold your hands up. Okay, it looks like from here over, we got it going on. What about over here? What's happening? Okay, okay, there's a couple. Okay, so if you don't know, how many of you are like, what is she talking about? Okay, okay, I'm so glad that you're here because now I have a reason to say what I'm gonna say. Thank you. So Jesus Revolution is a movie about Greg Cathlory, Chuck Smith, and Lonnie Frisbee, who are... Some of them are the founders of Calvary Chapel, which is our DNA all the way back, I don't know, 40 or 50 years ago. So with that said, if you want to know the origins of Love Church, go see the movie, The Jesus Revolution. Sound good? You going to do it? You're going to do it. I know you will. It was good, but you want to know what? If you know the people in the movie, you cry the entire, I literally bawled the entire, you did too, didn't you? Because you know them. You cry the whole time. So hopefully you guys won't have that same experience because it was so overwhelming, but Holy Spirit was just all about it, like the seeds planted. One thing I thought was so cool, it was about revival. And the same week that revival is going on in our nation, that movie comes out. That's no coincidence. We call it a god right? So 1 Corinthians, let's talk about who is the author. You guys, how many of you are in our reading guide? At Love Church, we do this reading guide. We're reading through the book of Psalms right now in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, we're reading the uh, the book 1 Corinthians. And in our small groups, we read it together, we study it together at home. We're hoping you're doing it individually. And then on Sunday, when we come, one of our pastors will teach from the last seven days worth of that reading. And so yesterday, Psalm 23 was on the docket for... I'm going to call him Pastor O.C. Yeah. It was on the docket yesterday. How many of you were encouraged by that word? Right? Like he's always with us and in his presence we have all of these things. So, so, so good. And then one other thing that we're going to learn today in the book of 1 Corinthians is how Paul encouraged the church that he planted in Corinth. Right? So Paul, author of 13 books in the Bible, was inspired by God the Holy Spirit to write to the church at Corinth. And the agenda in this book really is instruction, correction through a letter, right? So how many of you have had, let's just say, a relationship with your dad where you've been encouraged? We'll call it encouraged, but really corrected. Anybody in the room? Yeah? No, just a couple of you got encouraged? Where's the ones that got the belt? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> well, yes. You know, some of us have to have that hard slap across the face kind of discipline. Some of you just need a, that was me. Some of you just need a little feather of a touch. Oh, honey, you need to do it this way. Okay, I can't wait to obey. Right? Some of you are just angels. You come with the halo out of the womb. Like, that's what's going to happen with your baby, Right? What what I think is so incredible about this is Paul, the spiritual dad of this church. He leaves and he's catching wind of all of the things that are going crazy at the church in Corinth. And you know, it's like when mom and dad go away and we come back and the babysitter's like, this is what happened, y'all. Some of the babysitter's like, they they were perfect. But then some of them are like, they did this and they did that. They're, Paul's getting letters. He's getting understanding of what's going wrong in the church. And so he's like the spiritual dad called to encourage. Sometimes we like being held accountable, and other times it's not fun at all, right? How many of you love to be challenged? You love it? I, no. You love, to be, you love to be told you're wrong and get better. Okay, that's more honest. (laughs) Everybody's hands are like, oh, I hate being coached. But when you have a coach, let's just think about it now in the, like how many of you in here are parents? Aunts, maybe an uncle or two in the room. The idea of you want the best for someone you love 
You want to coach. You want to instruct. You want to take your life experience and pass it along so it wasn't like, I learned the hard way for no reason. Like, oh, I learned the hard way so I can share with you, right? And so Paul has had these experiences in all the churches that he's ministered in. God, the Holy Spirit, has taught him so much. And so now he's willing to breathe that life over. And the question is, are we willing to receive it? right? Are we really willing to receive the coaching? Yesterday, we had an opportunity to be coaching some believers up. This church happens to be a newer church. So with a newer church, there's a lot of new people that they live in a city that is completely saturated in sin, right? So just picture yourself coming out of the world, sopping wet with sin, now being confronted with the truth of the word of God. And now, I know none of you have ever gone through this, And now God, the Holy Spirit, is charging you to become more like him, to let go of the things that are hindering your growth and to put in the things that are going to make you more like him. That's hard, right? That challenge isn't easy. And so when he catches wind of what's going on, he's so faithful to respond. I was challenged even with that word. He's so faithful to respond. When you see someone that you love that's just beginning to walk with the Lord, Are you faithful to encourage? Are you faithful to exhort? Are you faithful to call higher? Are you faithful to make the call? Are you faithful to love well, even in the hard moments? He's so faithful to so many churches. I was so blessed just by the fact that he was willing to respond. Are you willing to respond? In the first portions of the text, our spiritual dad is really correcting a lot of things. The biggest thing he was correcting was division in the church, divisive spirits, divisiveness, one coming against another, my way or the highway, and he's here to lay down the truth so that we can all be in unity. And so one thing we're going to see today, there could be diversity of gifts and personalities and styles, but unity in the spirit. Because if I'm in the Holy Spirit and you're in the Holy Spirit, We could be one in him, amen? Your gift can be completely different than my gift, and we're gonna see people express gifts later, but my gift and your gift, they could be entirely different, but if we have the same Holy Spirit operating through us in this gift, it's gonna glorify God and build up the body, not divide the body. And here, the body was being divided. People were walking in pride. People were operating in jealousy. People were operating out of bitterness. People were confused because they were sopping wet with the world, now called to be a Christian, but it was a little bit confusing because there wasn't someone there to kind of pave the way of modeling this is what it looks like until Paul comes to this place of willingness to hold accountable. Okay, guys, division in the body of Christ isn't God's will. Let's, let's walk in unity. Let's confess the places that we need in the way of idolatry or sexual immorality. Another one is not going to the world for the answer. A lot of times we're tempted to take our case to the court, but God is asking and inviting us to go, this is chapter six in 1 Corinthians, go to Holy Spirit, ask him for the answer, and then walk in obedience. If two believers are walking in obedience, God can bring the resolution. But if I go to the world for the answer, I'm going to get what the world established as law and not what God established as law. I mean, in some cases, trust can tell us some of our law is built on God's word, right? It's, It's true. But in some cases, not. Another thing he addresses is marriage vows. So resolving issues with brother and sister inside the church, marriage vows and what it looks like. We talked about that last week at church for our our marriage. How many of you got to go to the marriage event? Did you, were you convicted? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What'd you, what'd you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. So good. God was so faithful. Another thing he addresses is how to walk as a young believer, a new believer. And then even the point of what does taking communion look like? Right? We did that yesterday as a church. We're going to pick it up chapter 12 where he starts talking about the gifts and what was happening in the church at Corinth is it was madness. The gifts were being exercised but with the wrong motivation. If you look at chapter 12 through 14 in 1 Corinthians and you look at the middle, the very middle of those three chapters, the chapter 13 is the what chapter? The love chapter, and that we titled tonight, Love, the More Excellent Way, or Let Love Be Your Highest Goal. And you see that at least three or four times. 
throughout this text. But before that even, when he's talking about taking communion, he's saying, are you willing to examine yourself? Are you willing to take the word of God and make it what it is, the mirror? Are you allowing this to be our standard? Or is it the world that's my standard, how you made me feel? That's my standard. So my response is what I feel like because of the way you made me feel. Well, could we let the word of God be our standard and our response be based off of what Holy Spirit's inviting us to do? In the way of spiritual gifts, they were operating in all these gifts without the love being the motivator. And so he's inviting us here as a body of believers tonight, as a body of women, to operate and be motivated by his agape love, right? So let's pick it up in chapter 11. It says we're like, let's examine ourselves. In chapter 12, he's saying, no, guys, we can't have you be, be ignorant in spiritual gifts, right? Chapter 12, verse 1. And then he says, you know that you, you are carried away to these things called with an idolatry. I'm going to drop all the way down to verse 3. Therefore, I make known to you, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one, and here come the spiritual gifts that we see listed in 1 Corinthians. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts, plural, of healings by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But, verse 11, gotta love it here, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, and this is key, as he, God, wills. I'm going to stop there and just take a minute to kind of walk through what we just read. What you see here is we have the diversity of gifts. Like how many of you, even in this room, know, I know God operates through me in a certain gift. I know what my gift is. Raise your hand if you know some of the gifts that God's given you. Love that. So cool. How about, you know what? I know that I'm a Christian and I love Jesus, but I'm not quite sure how he operates through me. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. Love the honesty in here. So some, sometimes, and, and we were talking about this with our leadership team earlier, we'll walk with the Lord and we're so thankful for him saving us. We know that now he, because I said yes to him as savior, he deposited his spirit. It's like a thumbprint of his promise of heaven, his promise of eternity. He deposited his spirit in you and I, and now his Holy Spirit lives in us, and he, God the Holy Spirit, will operate through us in differing gifts. And that's what it's saying here. There are diversities. There's all different kinds. Just like your thumbprint is different than mine, your gifts, your gift set, entirely different than mine. And not just the gift. Like, let's just say I have the gift of prophecy. Bree has the gift of prophecy. Because we're two different humans with two different personality types and environments that we were raised in, the gift of prophecy will look extremely different from one person to the next. So this is one thing that we want to challenge us tonight. There's a diversity. Say with me, diversity of gifts. So what does that mean for me and you? I can look on this stage and see all these worship leaders, and I can look right here and see these wonderful artists, and I can look out there and see these prayer warriors praying, and my temptation in the flesh might be to compare, right? Like, guys, let's be honest, girls, right? It's easy to go there, but what we would really want to work on and be with the Lord in is, God, you've designed me perfectly unique. Can you say that with me? He designed me perfectly unique for his glory. I'm different than everybody in this space, right? Do you know it and believe it? For his glory. 
Your unique gift set is for him to glorify himself through and to edify the body of Christ. And it just said in there, as he wills and to profit all. So every spiritual gift that he distributes is gonna look different in every one of you. So it's really easy to want to imitate what you've heard. Now I'm gonna say something and you could take this offensively, but I, could, I have heard in a room the gift of tongues and it might be a conjured up thing like saying the same syllable 1,000 times. And I want you to think about it in the language of English. How often do you hear the same syllable 1,000 times when someone's talking? Not very often, maybe a few, right? So what I'm saying is I can look on and imitate what the person next to me is doing and not really operate in the unique personality that God made me, or I can seek the most high God for the gift that he's distributed in me, unique personality, unique design for his glory. And as I'm with him one-on-one, -on -one, that distribution, remember the disciples, they distributed. Jesus gave each of them something to distribute when he fed the 5,000. He gave you a gift to distribute to the people, to the masses around you. It's gonna look very different. If I give every one of you one of these note cards and I say, go encourage if, let's just pick somebody in the room. Go encourage Abby. If every one of you were called to encourage Abby, more than likely it would sound a lot different each card that she read, right? Because your life experience and what the Lord's laying on your heart might be a little different. Some might be very similar. And so what I would challenge us, the very first thing is, it's a diversity of gifts. There's a broad range of gifts. Not just, no, there's, yeah, there's these nine gifts we're gonna look at right here today. But in those gifts, it can look very different. Amen? Isn't that exciting? It's like, you know, you can see, like, I don't know why, I just got a picture of, like, the Chinese military. You know, they, like, they like walk, like, you know, like, and they look so perfect and exactly the same, and, like, you can barely tell them apart, and, whoa, it's like, there's so many of the same thing, and I'm not trying to dishonor anything or anyone, any unit of any sort. However, if I look in this room, I see beauty all around, and it looks very unique and very different, and that's exactly what he, what he made your gifts like. Very unique, very beautiful, very different than the person next to you. And the fullness of what God wants you to experience with him is incredible when we seek him with our whole heart to have that gift. It's like he's putting, if you put on Christ, he's distributed himself in you to portray and display who he is. And so as you operate in those gifts, people look on in your workplace, people look on in your family life, people look on in your neighborhood, and they get to experience Christ in you and beauty and glory and be drawn to him if you're willing. That's why he distributed gifts, that he would be glorified, people drawn to him, and the body of Christ would be edified, right? Make sense so far? Okay, so the first gift that we see there, verse eight, well, first, verse seven, he talks about the diversity of gifts, the differences of ministries, the way that he ministers different for you. It doesn't matter. It's the same spirit, same Lord, same God, even the different activities. Verse seven talks about the manifestation of the spirit given to each for the profit of all. How about that word manifest? Have you guys heard it lately? Have you heard it in a negative way lately? Yeah? Can we not be afraid of that word and own it? Do you know what I mean? Every single thing that God does, the enemy wants to imitate, amen? Every single thing that God does, the enemy wants to imitate. So of course, if there's a taste of God in the air, somebody wants to mimic it and call it whatever it is so they could lead people astray. So when you see people saying, well, I'm gonna manifest this thing, not from God. The only one that can manifest truly and genuinely is God the Holy Spirit through you. Has nothing to do with you, right? You can think all you want in the way of creation, create, I wanna create a child in my womb. Guess what? Until God decides there's gonna be a child birthed in your womb, it's not happening, right? There's a, there's a beauty of him being creator. And so in his time, when he says, how he says, with whom he'll do what he wants to do. Us manifesting is only us yielding. Can you say that with me? I yield. He manifests. He manifests himself so that people 
can get to know who he is, right? If you're here yesterday, you're in worship, and you get to experience God in a really cool way. How many of you worship, when you, when you worship God, you experience something, right? Like you kind of can't put your word, you can't put words, I just experienced your presence, God, this is crazy. I'm feeling, so- do you feel something? Right, like he's manifesting his presence. He's making himself known to you. He's saying, I wanna be intimate with you. When you're experiencing that, he's manifesting his presence. Now in the same way, in all of the spiritual gifts, he manifests himself through you by the power of his Holy Spirit in the gift set that he gave you to love people and make himself known. Amen? So we wanna be careful with that word and how we allow it talked about in our homes and teach people. Just be really honest. Now, don't be obnoxious and rude. Be tactful and be kind. That's the number. You guys should look at Galatians 5.22, right? The number one, we're gonna get to it in chapter 13. The number one fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. If it's not wrapped in love, close your mouth, right? If love isn't the, the thing edifying coming out, it's really, we probably shouldn't be talking. Okay, the first gift mentioned here is a word of wisdom, And I just want to give an example of that. It's strategy not known to man, right? It's a way that God gives us, almost like a a, a way to come to a conclusion or find an answer. If you will, I love the example of Solomon when he has those two women come to him with the babies. Do you guys remember the story? And there one is truly her child. They come with a baby and they're like, this is what happened. Here's the story. We killed the one baby last night. This is the baby left. And both women are claiming that this is my child. And what does Solomon say to do? Cut him in half. Find me a sword. And as he goes and gets the sword to cut the baby in half, what happens? The real mom, genuine birth mother, starts what? Take the baby, take the baby, no. Her response was love. And only the word of God would say, go get a, only the spirit of God would say, go get a sword. That was a word of wisdom. Nobody's gonna say, cut a kid in half. That's just not something people think of. But God, the Holy Spirit, knew the real mom would be known if I give you this word of wisdom. So why does God give us words of wisdom? The next one, well, we'll put these two together. The word of knowledge, knowing of, sometimes it's a fact, Sometimes it's just a truth that the natural mind couldn't conceive or come up with. Like, there's no way I could have known that fact. There's no way I could have known that date. There's no way I could have known that name. There's no way I could have known. It was a drop from Holy Spirit in heaven. It came in my mind. I have no idea where that came from. And then it comes out and God uses it. Now, with words of wisdom and words of knowledge, sometimes that... um, you, like, you wonder, if you're operating in that gift and you're learning how to operate in that gift, sometimes you wonder, what do I do with this? Like, what, I don't even know how to, how many of you have like had a thought, a premonition, you might call it, you know, that's God the Holy Spirit teaching you how to operate in a gift, right? Sometimes people will try and take credit for it and be like, oh, I'm really good at knowing things, or I have great premonition. No, you don't. God the Holy Spirit is teaching you how to operate in the gift that he gave you. Try to, try, we, it's really easy for us to try and take credit for who God is, (laughs) but really it's God, the Holy Spirit, giving us these words of wisdom, these words of knowledge. With words, most often, he wants you to pray. He wants you to be a prayer warrior. He wants to make you an intercessor. He wants to teach you the ways of how to really make the foundation of everything you're seeing come from prayer, right? It's It's really hard when you have a word of knowledge to keep it in. I just heard this thing and I need to share. Well, sometimes he's not asking you. There's times when he asks me to not say something for over a year. And I'll see him the person every day. You want me to say something for a year? Like, I can't, I don't know if I could do this, right? Like, so there's sometimes when he's just asking you, can you learn how to pray? Take that to me. No, let's keep moving. Verse 10 talks about working of miracles. Oh, I'm sorry, nine. Faith. I just wanna call this the power to believe. Sometimes God will distribute the gift of faith for you to believe something no one else around you will, at, will believe, right? That God is able to do whatever the thing is. And I don't wanna put words in anybody's ears or whatever, but God might give you the faith to believe for a miracle. God might give you the faith to believe for healing. And he distributes to each as he wills. 
right? God gives you the gift of faith. Do you notice how some people operate in worry and fear? and I, I, There's just this constant like, concern. And then somebody else who has been given the gift of faith looks on at that person like, what is wrong with you? Like, sh- just stop. God gave you a gift just because they don't operate in that gift. We shouldn't look down on someone who's stuck in a, a place of bondage, right? The person with faith should then come alongside and operate in that gift and pray over again. Use your gift for prayer, right? Pray over the person who's struggling to believe God for something. The next one talks about gifts. Notice that there's an S on the end of that, of healings. And I love like there's various kinds of gifts. This is really interesting because some people have a really, um, they have a gift for a certain thing. And I know just different people in the body, and if they lay hands on a womb, oftentimes that womb will be healed. Or if they lay hands on eyes, oftentimes those eyes will be healed. Or if they are given the gift of healing, it's a one-time situation. Pastor Chuck, who is in that movie that we're talking about, he he was begging God in the desert for like, I don't even remember, I think it was like 10 days, he went in the desert and just begged God for the gifts of healings. And he's like, I just never operated in that gift. I really want to receive the gift. Chapter 12, verse 31 tells us to earnestly desire the gifts. And so that's what he was doing. He was in the desert earnestly desiring the gifts of healing. But you can't conjure healing up. God distributes you the faith to to pray it out and ask God for healing. And he's the one who heals. You don't have the gift to distribute. He's the one, right? Like he gives it to you to distribute. Does that make sense? So he's seen this guy come up in a wheelchair, Pastor Chuck, at the end of a worship encounter, and the guy comes up and he's like praying, like, you want me to pray for healing for this guy? And so he does. He prays over the guy and he tells him, get up out of the chair. He gets up out of the chair and his family is like praising God and they're so excited. And they're like, we just came up to ask you to pray over his cold. He's not feeling good. (laughs) And so if he would have stopped and listened to what they asked for, maybe his faith would have been hindered to not pray for him to get up out of the chair. Who knows? But how cool that God distributed faith for something they weren't even asking for in that moment. How beautiful is that? So sometimes, like the the four guys that lowered the man, the paralyzed man, they pulled tiles off the roof and lowered the man, we talked about this at staff today, into the face of Jesus or at the feet of Jesus for this man to be healed. The friend's faith, right? The four friends' faith that brought him to Jesus. Sometimes, how many times has God asked you to intercede for others? Sometimes it's for physical healing, literally something that you can see with your eyes or they can feel with their body, but sometimes it's spiritual healing. I have a friend in the body praying on behalf of a loved one right now, God, reveal yourself. Heal her spiritually. Let her see you. Make yourself known to her, begging God over and over. I don't want anything to happen to her until she knows you intimately. Do you think that motivation is love? Do you see it? Do you see the love of the Father, right? It's a beautiful thing when you see people operating out of love being their motivation. Verse 10 talks about working of miracles. All over the Bible you see Jesus working miracles. I love the water into wine miracle. How many of you have done that? You turned water into wine last night? (laughs) You did, didn't you? (laughs) No, really, like, can you imagine, worker of miracles? God says, I'm gonna bestow the gift, working of miracles. I have heard testimony after testimony of the craziest thing. I've got, I've, it's unbelievable what God has done. I've heard testimony of God raising people from the dead. I heard testimony of people having metal plates from surgery and the literal metal plates coming out of their body. There's crazy different testimonies here and now. This isn't just for when Jesus walked the earth. These gifts are for here and now. And some of the things, like when he walked on water, that's a miracle, when Pete, right? When he calls him out of the boat and he walks on the water, that was a miracle. When he stills a storm or feeds 5,000, those are all miracles. One of the modern day miracles I think that we forget to celebrate is when he flips the heart of a man and transforms him, yeah. right? Like you see people coming up here and their whole life turned upside down. That's a modern day miracle. When you see restoration in marriages, when you see people coming to their saving faith, that is a miracle of the most high God, right? That we get to see and participate in. It's crazy to think on what we might hinder God from doing simply because we're not willing. 
I love how, uh, we'll get to it later in a minute, but the next one talks about prophecy, and this is a fun one. I feel like in this body, we have so many prophets. In this room right here, we have so many prophetesses. It's true. I'm gonna call on you in just a little bit here. Don't sit there with your hands crossed. You're gonna prophesy. You too, you're gonna do it. I wanna just clarify a couple things. Prophecy, the noun, prophesy, the verb. Say it with me. I will prophesy. It's different. You'll hear it one's with a C, one's with an S. And, and when you're prophesying, you're either proclaiming truth, simply the truth. If you know the word of God, you're a prophet. If you know the word of God, you're a prophet. Because in this world of lies, you're speaking truth. You're called as a Christian to prophesy. You're called as a Christian to desire the gift to prophesy. God has called you to speak truth. Wrapped in love, Ephesians 4.15, but he's called you to speak truth. Say this with me. I'm called, I'm called. to prophesy. prophesy. Ask him. What does that look like for me this week? What am I supposed to invite you into, Lord? Where is it? It's gonna be you. He's gonna do it. He can't wait. Sometimes you're simply proclaiming truth. Other times he's allowing you, that's called forth telling. Sometimes he's asking you foretell. Prophets of old often brought warning or judgment, Old Testament. You saw it over and over and over. Prophets of the New Testament, what do they bring? Truth, love, comfort, joy, sometimes warning, sometimes judgment. But when you look at Jesus, what did he bring? He's the greatest prophet of all time. Did you, what did you see with the woman at the well? What did you see with the adulterous woman? Was it judgment? Right? Forgiving power, love, Truth, go and sin no more. Call, called it what it was. But wrapped in love, he gave that woman hope, right? That's what he's inviting you into in the way of prophesying. Discerning of spirits is the next one. This is so fun. <laughs> I love this one. <laughs> we always joke around and say, put your what? Spiritual antenna up. Y'all, put your, and I'm just picturing this little headband with these little like bobbly things, you know, going on. It's literally, you're called to put your spiritual antenna up. You walk in a room and you, because God the Holy Spirit lives in you, you walk in a room and God the Holy Spirit will give you discernment, oftentimes, something evil is going on right here. Flee. Prophesy. Pray. Love. Lay hands, cast out demons. He'll give you understanding of what is in the room. Last night, we had an opportunity for deliverance in the young adult meeting, and this girl was saying she was levitating. She could feel her body coming off the ground. So we had the opportunity to lay hands and ask God to deliver her, right? Well, if that testimony and boldness didn't happen, the ears wouldn't hear, sometimes though, he'll just give discernment, and the person will just walk right up and start praying. The girl doesn't even have to testify, right? But if we have our spiritual antenna up, sometimes that antenna will catch the God given the discernment and empower you to go do the thing he's asking you to do. And again, it might just be pray, right? You might be the catalyst for the prophet. You might be the catalyst for the one who's going to deliver. You might be the catalyst in prayer for the one who's going to. And so your, your responsibility might be prayer. Their responsibility might be deliverance, but that's how it comes. God, I love how Jesus calls it out, prayer and fasting sometimes, right? So there's so much opportunity in the discerning of spirits. When you're discerning spirits, you'll either think God will give a word and it might sound something like that's a human with a human opinion. They're saying it's God, but that's a human opinion. God might say, that's darkness, that's from the pit of hell, that is not from me, that's Holy Spirit, that's me. So you'll hear one of three things, that's from man, that's from God, that's from the pit, 
right? So there's, when you're having discerning of spirits, God gives you all kinds of different ways to respond in any one of the gifts. Different kinds of tongues. How many of you in here operate speaking in the gift of tongues? Operate in the gift of tongues, a beautiful gift sometimes, and you'll see it in these texts. It's prayer language between you and the Father, and it's just you and the Father, and it's your closet time. You and God alone, you have a language that's unknown to the speaker. So when it's a gift of tongues, that means it's unknown to the speaker what the language is. It's discerned by Holy Spirit, and he's speaking it to the Most High God. Sometimes in a room this size, the gift of tongues will come out and then we'll ask for an interpretation and it might be a prophecy instead of an interpretation. So what does that mean? Sometimes the interpretation, it's vertical and it's to God. Other times it's the person's prophesying and it's like, Lyndon, I heard that. God said you're gonna, and it starts talking about her future or something about Lyndon. Sometimes more than one thing can be true, so keep that in mind. It's not always the same. 99.999% of times, it's affirmation of who God is. Your tongue interpretation more than likely is gonna be about who he is. And it says it will profit all in verse 26 of chapter 14. Verse two of chapter 14 says it will bring glory to God and who he is. Verse 26 says it'll profit all. Well, if you know who God is and I know who God is, will it profit me? You better believe it. If I know God is provider and I'm lacking right now and I need provision, would I be rested knowing that God is provider? You bet, you bet, yeah. If I have a need that's not met or I don't believe that God cares and then as the tongue goes out and the interpretation comes and the interpretation says, God, you are our refuge. God, you are our strength. God, you are my hiding place. Do you think that I would be comforted? Absolutely, right? So most often, the interpretation of the tongue is gonna talk all about how good God is. And it's gonna profit everybody in the room. Does that make sense? Are you so excited to operate in the gift of tongues tonight? I'm gonna have you line up up here. Okay, this is another thing we talked about as leaders. One thing that happens when somebody steps out, okay, if somebody has the gift of tongues, they're usually scared to talk about it, why? or to operate in it. Why would they be scared? Scared. <laughs> Why would you be scared to pray for healing? What if it doesn't happen? So this is what I told our young adults last night. Have one ear on what the person is asking you to pray for and another ear pointing to God. So your antenna looked like this. <laughs> What, is it, what do I mean by that? I mean, you want to hear the cry of the heart of the person coming to the altar for prayer because it's a huge weight in their life right now. But you want to be in, in agreement with what Holy Spirit is asking you to pray. That person may or may not know what Holy Spirit is asking you to pray. Right? So if I'm only operating in the gift of mercy, I might just pray what they're asking me. Will you get rid of my husband? I can't stand him anymore. I want to move on. <laughs> Lord, can you please get rid of her husband? I can't wait to see this happen. <laughs> Would I be operating in the gift of the Holy Spirit, you think? No. Probably not. I mean, <laughs> there was JL, right? Do you guys know that story? With the tent peg? Y'all, come on. This, <laughs> yes, we'll talk about it another day. <laughs> it's in the Old Testament where judgment happened. There is an opportunity for us to take our ear to the person in need because we truly want to live in the, and operate in the gift of mercy and compassion and listen and hear the heart. But more important than man and what they think they need is me going vertical and asking, God, what do you want to pray over this person? What's important to you for their heart? And then he distributes as he wills what that prayer looks like, right? And it will profit for certain that individual, absolutely, 100%. So having that listening ear is key, but it's definitely gonna benefit the people and it's always gonna glorify God. Verse, chapter 12, verse 11. But on the same spirit, oh, the same, I'm gonna go in my Bible, not there. 
Verse 11, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each as he wills. Verse 12, for the body is one and has many members. This is so cool. But all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And then it goes on to share, what if the foot doesn't want the, you know, you guys know that whole portion where it says, what if the hand said, I don't need you foot? And what if the foot says, I don't care if you're cut off hand, you know, you get it. But the idea here is, if we all have differing gifts, there could be unity in that diversity, right? There could be unity in the diversity. Now, if there's conflicting things going on, one of us is not in the spirit, or two, right? If we have conflict, we're not in the spirit. If we have unity, we're walking in the spirit. Does that make sense? He's not gonna argue with himself. The triune Godhead (laughs) operates in oneness. So if I have conflict with someone, and I think it's them, I need to take out my mirror. I need to just get in the word of God and take out my mirror and and humble myself before the most high God and ask him to reveal what it is he wants to reveal. Because in the body of Christ, he hungers and thirsts for oneness. Why? Think of it like this. If I'm called to portray and display the most high God and I'm conflicting, with the body of Christ, I'm fighting with the bride. We're just giving Jesus a bad name, right? And he's saying, I've built my bride to shine my light for my glory so people can know me, right? And that's what he invites us into. And so the first thing would be like, let's, when if I'm not one, it says, but one and the same spirit works all these things. And then it says, by one spirit, we're immersed. Verse, this is verse 13 in the trans, I love the translation, the passion. It says this, for by one spirit, we are all immersed and mingled into one single body. And check this out. No matter our status, Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are all privileged to drink deeply in the same Holy Spirit. And then verse 18, I'm gonna drop down to it. It says this, God has carefully designed, going back to your design, each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. And it says, because we are all one, there should be no division, but that the members should have the same care for one another. For example, if one suffers, we all suffer. If one is honored, we all rejoice. So when somebody in your neighborhood in the way of your Christian friend's family When they're being blessed and somebody's celebrating them, are we looking on with a jealous eye? Are we so excited they're being honored? We should be cheering them on. We should be the first one to be like, I'm so excited that God's blessing you. Instead of looking on with jealousy, instead of looking on with insecurity, instead of looking on in a place of comparison. When people are blessed, I love your shirt, says blessed, Pilar. When people are blessed, especially people we know and love, we should be so fired up, right? Like, could we be the best cheerleaders ever? Wouldn't that be so cool if we're all cheering each other on? That's what the body of Christ is built to do. And say these words with me. Build up. up. Stir up. up. Cheer up. up. That's what the body of Christ is built to do. Hopping down, chapter 12, verse 27 talks about all of the different appointments in the church. I'm just going to roll through them, and then we're going to drop all the way down to chapter 13 and end there. It says, uh, Joel, if you want to come up. I don't know. Do you have way too much? Where's Joel? Joel and Rachel, if you want to come up, please do. Um, Verse 27, it highlights for us in verse 27 of chapter 12. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually and God has appointed these in the church. So think of the church at large, big C church, globally, nationally, citywide, uh, and church, uh, different expressions of church bodies, like City Light, like Love Church, like Life Church, like Life Gate. In each church, he appoints them. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps. I love the gift of helps. Administrations, praise Jesus for that. Varieties of tongues. And this is what's so cool. Are all prophets, 
or apostles, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have the gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. And then it says this, but earnestly desire those gifts. However, however, I show you a more excellent way. And here's what we started off with and here's what we're gonna end with. It doesn't matter how cool those gifts sound. If my motivation isn't love, I shouldn't even really want to desire to operate in them. Right? Let's start with love. Can we start with love? So let's go back to chapter 11 where it says, examine yourselves. We're gonna do the fourth grade model here. Where are my fourth grade teachers? Yes. (laughs) The fourth grade model here like we did when we were younger. Ash, you probably know this too. Love is, right? So chapter 13 is challenging us. Though I speak with tongues of men, sometimes your tongue can be of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned as a martyr, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And then it goes on, verse four through eight, what love looks like. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things. Love hopes all things. My husband always says, love doesn't walk around like an Eeyore Christian. (laughs) He thinks that's so funny. (laughs) Love endures all things. You guys, this is the coolest thing. This text, I think it's in the Passion, I can't remember. Um, The last verse where it says love, verse eight, never fails. Prophecies will fail and tongues will cease. Knowledge It'll vanish away. And and the only thing that will remain in love, the very last verse of the chapter, it says, abide in these. What does it say? The very last verse of that chapter. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And so the question is, when's the last time I was willing to look in the mirror of love in this chapter and ask Holy Spirit to bring sweet conviction of the places that I need to grow, right? Like, am I willing to go there? Am I willing to grow? And so we put on the screen, like just a blank line. Do I suffer long? Am I patient with my family, with my friends? Am I patient with my kids? Am I patient with God when I'm waiting on an answer, right? And then it says, love is kind. Put your name in there and just literally say it out loud. Denise is kind. Can I truly say that? And I don't mean just to the one person who I just met today because they did nothing to offend me. I mean to the one who I really don't love. (laughs) Can I truly ask Holy Spirit to love through me in the way of kindness? How about this? Love does not envy. Can you put your name in there? I loved how it says, it doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. Do you rejoice in the truth? How about the love never fails? In the uh, Passion Translation, it says this, love never stops loving. Love never stops loving. Have you ever lived with somebody for a certain amount of time, now suddenly you don't like them anymore? (laughs) I mean, I'm being honest and really real, right? There's people in our life where for a season, God had you guys doing life together, and for whatever reason, something happened, right? Have you been there? These are the moments where we have to take a self-examination. And yeah, God's in, he's asking us to forgive. And some people love to live in this place of, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. Sometimes, yeah, if you've been raped by someone, you can ask God to empower you to forgive, but you may have to establish some sort of boundary with where you go and what you do and how far you allow yourself to come into contact with an individual like that. But there's times in our life where we'll stand in this position and God's really inviting us into full forgiveness. That's what he did on the cross for us. He could have held us 
literally an account. It's our rap sheet over our head for everything we've ever done. And if I had my rap sheet here tonight, there's no way I'm getting into heaven. There's no way that I have a relationship with the Most High God. There's no way. And yet, by the grace of God, He allowed me to make the exchange where I confess all my sin. And then His blood, when He died on the cross, lived a sinless, perfect life on earth, then goes to the gruesome, brutal cross for me and for you as I'm willing to put my faith in the fact that he died for my sin, I'm just simply putting my faith in the fact that what he did was for me and for you. As we receive that, he then cleanses us. His word promises that we're made new, washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And now, not only are we clean and we have eternal life, his Holy Spirit comes inside us and we can operate in every one of these gifts. And the cool thing about the differing gifts, remember how I said they look different on you than your neighbor? I wanna share with you two pieces of art that I got within like a week of one another in two different states. And this is so cool. I was praying about spiritual gifts and I was asking the Father to just reveal in the season what he wanted me to know about the gifts that he gave me and my husband. And this, I was literally in Starbucks because I've never been there before. And this girl comes up, and her, her name was Chantel. She was a beautiful, maybe, maybe she was like from, I don't know, Polynesian Islands or Hawaii or something. She just looked beautiful. And she, she hands me this piece of art. What do you guys see? Yeah. She hands me this piece of art, and she says, I know that you're in question right now, and God has a message for you. It's about who he is and about who you are. God is a great decision maker. And all the decisions that you seek him for, he'll make through you. And this fire is a representation of how he's sealing all that he's giving you. It's being sealed with fire. You, Denise, are a great decision maker. She literally writes the note on the back of the art. What, what do you think happened in my heart when this girl stepped out in faith at Starbucks? What do you think happened? Just tell me. Encouragement. Encouragement. What else? Solidified affirmation. My faith increases. Do you think that I felt heard? Do you think that I felt seen? Right? There were things that only God knew that that woman could not know. She spoke them over me about circumstances that were going on in my life right then and had no idea who I was. God wants to use your gifts in the same way. Not even eight days later, I go to Texas to another thing. Now here's the thing, you might think, I have to be like Joel and so gifted in the realm of art in order to do something like that. That little fire was pretty, I mean, it was pretty nice. But this is one week later, y'all. In a different state, from a completely different person. Does it look like I had to be a professional artist to do this. I mean, if I'm really honest, I could probably get finger paint and just do something really simple. And we've done this as a team before. We've done finger painting and God prophesied through finger painting y'all with our team. And she wrote a letter on the back, not just about me, but about my husband and our ministry together and how each flame represents us individually. And she writes the characteristics of each flame and how when they're built together, what, it, what God does in the kingdom. And it was so simple, three lines of color, one heart connected to the Father, distributing through her gift a word of encouragement for his daughter. So simple yet so profound, right? Only God knows who you're gonna run into. Only God knew who Chantel was gonna run into who was already praying about something. Only God knew, I don't even know the other artist's name in Texas. I was in California with the Starbucks situation. I was in Texas with the other situation. Only God could have known all of that. And both words align. And then in addition to this, my husband and I were at a church and these two people, a couple, come up to us and they lay hands on us and they start prophesying over us and they say, I don't know why, but I see something like a fire or like a spark. And, and they just start walking in the the word and wisdom of prophecy and speaking over us 
about fire and spark and flame, and I recorded that one because I couldn't believe this could be three things in, in just a short period of time. It was only what God can know and say and do. And this is the thing, God doesn't have favorites, we're all his favorite. He wants to use you just like he did all of those artists and prophets. You are not less than any of them. He wants to use every single one of you for his glory. Every single one of you to draw people in. The question is, and I love it, in this, gosh, I don't even know the translation where, where it is, but let me see if I can find it. Hmm. When it says that he distributes as he wills, I love this text. One more, one more second. <laughs> Here it is. Verse 12 of chapter 14 is talking about prophecy in tongues. And it goes into how to operate and how they should be interpreted and they should be in turn. So there should be order in the church when we're using those gifts. If it's your prayer language, it's your prayer language. But if it's in the church out loud, if there should be some sort of order to it. But I love verse 12. It says, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And so it's, it's that word zealous, it's like zeal, Z-E-L-O-O, and it means passionately pursue the things of God for and on behalf of the people of God, right? That's what he wants to make you and I, a passionate pursuer of the things of God to glorify him and for the people of God. Is that something that you want? Yeah, so let's do this. Let's pray. I'm gonna invite Carrie and Savannah up. If you guys would both just come up and give, um, so I think Christy might, there she goes, she's got it. They're gonna share a little bit of a word of encouragement that they had on their heart. What's going on over here is I asked Joel, who operates in the gift of art, he's an art teacher, is it what, uh, West Bay? At West Bay Elementary. Can we give him a hand for sharing his gift with us? This is super exciting. And then I also asked his wife and him to kind of co-labor this time around so they could be a team and share. And so as he's working on that, uh, one thing I thought, do you notice how there's two extra canvases over there? The invitation is for anybody in the room who would want to come up and exercise their gift. And you guys, listen. <laughs> I'm not looking for a pro, I'm looking for a willing heart. Who's in? Who wants to operate in a gift? Maybe God's putting a word on you in your heart right now and maybe he's asking you to express it in some kind of way. There's two opportunities for you to take hold of. You can go and just stick your hand on it and say, God wants to high five you tonight. <laughs> I'm so serious when I say that because who knows if that might mean something. One time we were, I don't remember where we were and we heard this testimony, but someone said, I don't know why, but God is making me say you're wearing a yellow shirt. Can you imagine if, Michelle, you're wearing a yellow shirt. The crazy thing is, is the lady in the room that was wearing the yellow shirt when he was obedient to say those words said she was tired of being in the room of prophets that interpreted that meant something that God didn't mean, meaning, Say the, prophecy, say the prophecy and let God be the interpreter is what she was asking for. So he stopped at, you're wearing a yellow shirt. And then the woman knew, oh my gosh, God hears me, he sees me, he knows me. So sometimes he makes you say or do things that they mean something to the person receiving it, but for you it makes no sense at all. You're just stepping out in faith and obedience and this is how you approach it. If God's inviting you into something like that, let's be really practical. The practicals of that are this. Okay, well, I believe God's putting something on my heart for you. Test it. Ask the Lord what it means. Some people will come up and be like, I see a white heart, Madison, and this is what it means. And they're like screaming over you, and you're like, oh my gosh. Like, I don't know. And it's scary, almost, you know, or it feels really intimidating. Jesus never operated in some crazy, intimidating way when he was handling the people. Right? He was so loving, so kind. There were Pharisees that he called high for sure. And he was strong worded with them in correction. But most often you see him operating in love. There were prophets or prophecies where, yeah, he was calling people out. But when you operate 
in love, people receive love, love always wins, right? And you just say, hey, and here's the cool thing about this body, we're exercising and we're practicing together. So I just wanna know if this is from the Lord, I'm gonna say this out loud, you pray about it, see what the Lord says. And you walk away and you trust that you are walking in obedience and trust that you don't need to know the answer. You don't need to know what it means to them. You just walk in obedience in your part and they'll take it and walk in obedience in their part, amen? So let's stand up and ask and invite God to do some crazy cool things to these ladies. Father, we're just saying thank you that you love to teach us. Thank you that you love to show us more. Thank you that not only did you die on the cross for us so that we could have life in you, and if you're in this room and, and you've never committed your life to Christ, we wanna invite you up to talk to us. If you say, you know what, I do believe that Jesus came and he died on the cross for me and I do wanna walk in relationship with him. I am willing to confess my sin and believe that he forgives my sin. We'd love to talk to you and just encourage you and pray for you on your way in that walk with Jesus. So, Father, we say thank you that your blood is good enough for wherever we've been and not only did you leave and ascend into heaven and say, I'll see you later. You left and gave us your power and your authority by the gift of your Holy Spirit and any believer he lives in now. And so we just wanna take a moment to say thank you that you didn't leave us alone. Can you say that with me? Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you didn't leave us alone and thank you that you're empowering us and you wanna walk through us and every single unique set of gifts in this room. And so right now, God, Holy Spirit, we invite you to build up we invite you to stir up and we invite you to cheer up through every one of these women in this room. And so if anyone in here feels inadequate or unworthy in the name of Jesus, we ask that that spirit would flee and we ask that there would be no more agreements with the liar. We ask that the accuser would be gone and there would just be a newness of life and a reception for every daughter to operate freely with you and receive fully what you've given her and freely operate in it in Jesus' name. Okay, Savannah, go for it. All right, you guys.